So, hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, October 17th, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. That's Dr. Morgan Renberg. Whoa! <laughs> We're here at uh, Morgan's Secret Studio in uh, Fort Worth, Texas to do a live episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, as well, joining us remotely, we've got uh, Dr. Paul Sutter. Paul. In my secret studio. What is time? Oh, I'm intrigued. That... I got no idea. <laughs> okay, good. It's a very, very short episode of Ask a Space Man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So uh, you can always go back to the, do the split as well, right? But I guess it won't work very well yeah, because it's the... we would split yeah, ourselves in half. True. Good point. So maybe go back to us. I'm teaching Morgan how to engineer the show. Uh, so, you know, be... be... Be patient be, with them. Be nice. Uh, so this week we are going to talk about, uh, let's see, uh, the, the Ganymede, and I'm not exactly sure what. Is it on crack? No one knows. It's impossible to know. It has cracks. Uh, Chandra's back and operational. Uh, what happened with the Soyuz and what and how long can we keep astronauts up on the International Space Station? And two projects that are going to absolutely ruin the night sky for astronomers. So, uh, let's get it. You're going to love this, Paul. Uh, but, this week, special guest, Paul Geithner from James Webb. Paul, welcome back to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks. Uh, now, it's funny, we were setting up this, this interview and I was looking at the dates and it was uh, exactly pretty much two years ago uh, that you were here on the show with us, which is which is awesome. Uh, I'm assuming two years ago we talked about like dates and when James Webb is going to happen, and you made some predictions. But you know what? That's all just it's all just forgotten. Uh, let's just start with a clean slate. And uh, how how is the James Webb Space Telescope doing right now? Well, we we're going to launch this month, but uh, we got a little behind. But actually, things are in good shape. Um, the telescope, you know, last time we talked, the telescope was just wrapping up uh, cryo-optical, you know, end-to-end -end optical performance testing at cryo temperatures in a vacuum in Texas. It made it through Hurricane Harvey, and that test went great. Everything went really well. And um, it's delivered to California for final assembly with the spacecraft element, which is the spacecraft bus and the sunshield part of the observatory. And... Um, that's running behind, but we're almost, we're, we're basically done putting that all together and ready to put it through its environmental mm -hmm. tests before we put those two halves of the observatory together and then get ready to launch it. Now, the big news came out about, I guess about six months ago or so, where, where NASA had done a fairly in-depth it look into the state of James Webb and found a bunch of problems with the with the way the project management had happened with the main contractor with with Northrop Grumman um, has Northrop Grumman addressed those issues and and you know like I know that that NASA put together a new timeline for when the the spacecraft was going to launch are things now proceeding to, to a much higher level of satisfaction for for you folks um, in a word, yes. Um, you know, that's the, a good uh, word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, briefly the, uh, our, our delay of roughly two years came from two things. One was the complexity of sun shield turned out to be, uh, to, uh, get, give us a schedule. Uh, you know, it took a lot, it takes a lot longer to fold stow and then redeploy, you know, for testing the sun shield than we thought based on the engineering model we put together were some differences that really made a difference in the um, in the time it takes to do that. And then about the other half of the two year delay came from came from uh, some relatively simple but very consequential mistakes in the factory. Uh, three mistakes in particular. Um, we think we in North think we've recovered from those. Um, we just finished doing some really exhaustive um, audits, NASA and Northrop separately and together and. We think we're in good shape, and and what gives us some confidence is that, um, you know, the folks on the ground at Northrop have been executing to their plan um, for several months now. They're they're nailing it. So um, you know, if they keep going that way, 
we're gonna we're we're gonna be okay. But there are definitely some uh, first time things and risks ahead that are that are are scheduled threats. But but things are going things are going uh, better than they were. That's for sure. Well, there's always this point, uh, like in all the software projects that I've ever worked on, there is this point where you finally understand how much is left to do. And until that point, a lot of the complexities were still kind of hidden in, uh, just like they were just hidden in, in little areas that you hadn't fully explored yet. And when you finally do get to this point where you actually put the telescope on the the shake table and actually see how the thing operates and and run through the the sun shield expansion and and you can start to see if if the reality is matching what your what your expectations were and so it's nice to see that that now as you're moving forward with the i guess with this this latest report and things are things are moving that tell, that gives you more confidence that that you've discovered some of the I guess the mysteries and 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 uncovered them and 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 now can can proceed. So, if if we can now follow sort of the new schedule, then when should people expect to see the next milestones? What are going to be the next big milestones that people are going to want to see? Okay, the, the next big ones are um, we should be done with uh, acoustic and vibration portions of environmental testing of the the bus and sun shield. Um, by January, we should be getting into uh, thermal vacuum f for the sun shield and bus in February, and then uh, around April time frame, we should come out. And then the observatory becomes the observatory finally um, next fall. We put the, the sun shield and the bus and the telescope part together, and we've got a whole observatory late next year. And then uh, after, um, one last set of environmental tests and, and deploy in stows uh, to verify everything's going to deploy correctly in orbit. Then, you know, late in 2020, that's when we'll ship to the launch site and I'll be spending some quality time in South America. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get a chance to work on your tan in, uh, in cow. Is it, how do you pronounce it? Karu? Karu? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean that's going to be. How long will you be down at the at the launch site? Um, it's roughly a. It's between a seventy and eighty day campaign nominally. You know, we'll get some stuff there early, but the the telescope time there from you know when it arrives by ship to uh, the rocket lights, it's uh, um, it's almost three months. Now. Are there any problems with the Ariane 5? I mean, the, I know the Ariane 5 is reaching the end of its uh, lifespan, just the, the, the class of rockets in general, and Ariane space is moving to their Ariane 6. Is, is there going to be any problem with the launcher, or is that still okay? No, we're still good. Um, uh, Ariane uh, and Kness are planning to keep launching Ariane 5. Uh, beyond when our launch date is, um, I want to say 2022, but I, I, it's somewhere in that time frame. So, so we've got some cushion. Um, you know, the Ariane continues to be a really great launch vehicle. I'm pretty sure they just had their hundredth flight of the Ariane Five, um, and our version is really solid. Uh, so we're, you know, we're good there. We're, we're not in danger of, you know, flying on something that's obsolete or something like that. Now, we're at a time where the Hubble Space Telescope is in safe mode. Uh, one of its gyros is malfunctioning, and NASA is trying to work their way through this. Uh, and of course, this is after all of its gyros have been replaced and repaired by spacewalking astronauts. Uh, Chandra just came out of safe mode for, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the reasons were. Uh, we're going to talk about that later on in the episode. Um, and of course, Kepler has uh, is gone offline for, uh, again, it just, it just woke up to transfer a little bit of data and then it's gone back offline because it's essentially out of fuel. Uh, you know, does this group of, of gyro failures, of reaction wheel failures, you know, as you think about the that this can't be touched once it gets to its uh, Lagrange point. Uh, you know, is this factoring into any of your thinking or is it like the, it's already too late? Um, it's 
well, in a way, it's too late. I mean, the uh, uh, it's but you know, Hubble boy, Hubble was launched in 1990. We last serviced it in 2009. Um, it's got mechanical gyros. We have solid state gyros. Uh, we have six reaction wheels, so we got double redundancy there. You know, Chandra was launched in what 99, I think. So it's been up there a long time. Um, you know. We actually think they'll both still be working by the time we get up there. But although parallel operations uh, is nice, it's not required. I mean, the good news is we're sort of our delay. We're sort of hitting more of the sweet spot of tests um, in terms of the exoplanet science part. So, uh, um, but no, I'm not, I'm not really worried about web. You know, we've got good systems on there. Um, uh, our design life is is good, so um, you know Chandra and Hubble have been up there a long time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, even yeah. When he... yeah, like Chandra's twenty years, Hubble is thirty years. Twenty eight, yeah. Twenty eight, yeah, yeah. So obviously, so I'm a bit of a gyro and uh, and um, reaction wheel nerd. Uh, as people who watch the show know, you mentioned a solid state gyro. Can you explain, sorry, what that is? Seems like an oxymoron. Yeah, what is, a, <laughs> what is a solid state gyro compared to a mechanical one, like the one that Hubble? Because we, we, sorry, just to give you the update, we went into this in detail last week about the difference, how the gyros are there, are there for stabilization, that the reaction wheels are used right. for reorientation. What is a solid right. state gyro? Yeah, so we we, um, we use gyros that look, uh, have a um, look like a little tiny uh, champagne glass. Um, it's a it's a crystal piece of glass, and um, uh, the, the it's basically piezoelectric. The vibration, the standing wave that's set up in this crystal, it, it, there's no mechanical motion really. It, it's just a really high frequency uh, um, uh, vibration in the crystal. So as opposed to a spinning spinning wheel like like um hubble's old gyros have so there's really no bearings there's no wow really moving parts to wear out so um and there's also a thing called bring laser gyros where you've just got a spool of fiber and you, you run the um uh you know the laser light goes through the fiber and and um you actually sense motion that way too and that's the absolutely no no uh, mechanical motion but um anyway that's that's what we have so uh, you don't have th things to wear out like Hubble gyros do. That's I, gyros. So yeah, well, it's I mean, it's just like mission after mission. It's the gyros and the reaction wheels go, and that and that kills the whole whole mission. And I know that there's been some research in the last couple of years that there could be some there's some conditions in space that are that were maybe a little unforeseen and and now people are understanding why the wear and tear on the gyros is so is so heavy and why they're failing sooner than people were thinking so a solid state gyro that just sounds that just sounds like that's the best um to don't have it break uh so what um how is the uh I, you know i know this isn't isn't your field exactly but is the is the telescope's time already starting to fill up for the astronomers wanting to get access to to james webb um yeah you're right that's not my thing because uh, but i i know a little bit about that and i stayed at holiday Inn express last night so <laughs> you know, the, uh well the, the the call for cycle one right the first year of proposals was just about uh, those proposals were just about due, and we knew we were going to have a pretty big launch delay. So, so the Space Telescope Science Institute said, "All right, hold up, we'll delay this. Um, if you already submitted a proposal, just please resubmit it and or consider resubmitting it in a year or so." So, um, we know there's a lot of buzz in the science community, and we expect a pretty heavy set of proposals for Cycle One. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know the numbers or exact exactly how much, but, you know, if Hubble's a guide, we'll probably have on the order of five times more proposals uh, yeah. for the, every cycle than, than there's time, than there's clock time for. So that's a good problem to have. And you mentioned TESS is, you know, TESS is a much further ahead now because it's launched and is starting to, is already turning up planets that we always describe TESS as the finder scope for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, you know, it sounds like there's a much better now alignment of the work that these two instruments are going to be able to do since 
since Tess got up there sooner. Yeah, that I know the exoplanet community is stoked about, you know, Tess and, and web synergy. So uh, that's really exciting. I mean, it's I'm sure we're all going to be blown away by the discoveries. That Well, it ju Tess just announced, I think, its first exoplanet discoveries. And so we almost have a, a new way, I think, to, to do this mission where we can use ground-based telescopes uh, in the next 18 months to two years to filter those Tess observations down to the ones that are obviously very interesting and have a much more uh, carefully curated list of targets for Webb than we would have had if Webb needed to be observing them sort of simultaneous with detection. And so probably we'll get better observations in the end because we'll know more about which objects to look at. I think it was all part of the plan then. Ah, it was a master plan. <laughs> um, well, Paul, I don't want to take any more of your time, um, but uh, we're so grateful for you to come and give us, give us the update. Uh, good luck with this next testing period. I know it's a pretty fraught time as you uh, try to sort of pack the whole thing up and, and get it into its... Uh, when, when is that day now, do you think, when it's going to be on the boat and and there's no more fix in it until it shows up in, uh, in wow. South America? We, we think we could be on the boat as early as August of 2020. And, and that still gives us a lot of margin to our launch date. So, um, but yeah, it's probably no earlier than that, but yeah, you're looking at, at later in 2020 and we'll be on the boat to, uh, from Long Beach to, uh, Karoo. That's still less than two years away now. So actually it does, it is starting to get pretty close. Uh, well, Paul, where can people find out more about what you're doing and follow the ongoing progress of the mission? Ah, well, you know, we have, um, we have social media, um, We've NASA got a web. Facebook. Yeah. We've got a Facebook and a Twitter account. We've got, and of course, jwst.nasa.gov website. There's all kinds of good stuff there. So, um, and of course, you know, Google's your friend. You can just type in JWST and anything will come up. So, uh, yeah, you can keep track of us there. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Sorry about the rough start there. Um, but we uh, we got we got to the heart of it. And, uh, and good luck with James Webb. I mean, we're, think, we're pulling for you. We really are. We, just every week, we're just like, come on, launch. Thanks. Can't wait. So, uh, launch. Goodbye. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. So, before we get uh, any deeper into this week's show, uh, I just want to remind everybody that they should go to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Uh, the WSHcrew.space. They are the community that really help us out and make this show happen. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, Nancy Graziano helped organize this week's uh, guest, uh, which was awesome, um, and a lot of the upcoming guests as well. So if you want to be part of this community, go to WSHcrew.space, and uh, they will show you how to sign up. All right, Paul, you've been quiet. Other Paul, South, <laughs> South Paul, North Paul, you've been quiet too long. Um... First, what is time? And now I must be punished. Second, uh, what's happened with Ganymede? What is time? We have no idea. And don't necessarily listen to Sean Carroll. I don't think he has any idea either. <laughs> okay. All right. yeah, we got, a little got... delayed delayed shade there. Yeah, yeah. You now he's gone. He can't. He can't. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he, uh... Right. Always the more honorable route. <laughs> no, it, let, let me say, Sean Carroll is thinking some very, very interesting thoughts about time. He thinks very deeply about it. Uh, I don't think anyone is really very close to approaching an, a full understanding of what time is. There are lots of ideas out there, but it's so hard to tell what's right and what's wrong. I, I was at a science convention at Google about five years ago called the Sci Fu and there was three Nobel laureates sitting around a campfire having this exact conversation and I didn't understand a word of it. 
So, so it's possible that they were describing it, but I can't, I couldn't bring it back to help anyone else out. Well, they didn't even understand what I, they were that saying. That really felt like that's more like what it was. So I think that's okay. Uh, yeah, and so I, I just recorded actually a whole podcast episode about time, but really 90% of the podcast is about entropy. Right. That sounds great. People should go listen to that. Well, there you go. That's, there's your log rolling for the, for the week. Ganymede. Ganymede, things that are finite. <laughs> things that things that are potentially knowable. Um, yeah, so uh, this is this is I love I just love research like this where it's taking analogs of looking at the earth and our experiences on the earth and how we understand the the history of the earth and stuff on the earth and applying that to other worlds like this is how we are able to infer that what mars once had a lot of water because we see a bunch of features that water causes on earth we see the exact same features over on mars so we can say aha maybe in the past mars was wet and this is another great example of this um, uh, research studying Ganymede, which Ganymede has an icy crust and is thought to have a liquid water ocean underneath that crust. And what these researchers have done, these are researchers based at the University of Hawaii, by the way, of, have, they've looked at pictures. They've looked at pictures of the surface of Ganymede, just like you would look at satellite pictures of the surface of the Earth and they see features similar to what we see on Earth. In this case, they see fault lines in a very special kind of fault line called a, oh, I lost it here, I lost it, a slip, a strike slip boundary, where two tectonic plates on the Earth slip past each other, and they lead to a kind of pattern that looks like a flowering between them, a, a set of ridges that look like flower petals and they see this on Ganymede they see this in the ice of Ganymede this tells us that at some time in the past the ice sheet that covers Ganymede was broken up into separate plates that were rubbing and grinding against each other and floating on a liquid layer the exact same way the earth's crust is broken up into pieces rubs up against each other and quote unquote floats on a quote unquote liquid layer. And it's by studying the tectonics of the surface of Ganymede that we can understand the interior, just like by studying the tectonics of the Earth's surface, we can understand the interior of the Earth. Excited by these kinds of analogies. Yeah, this is a, a really big deal if it turns out to be true, because we really base almost everything we know in modern geology on the tectonic theory of of geology and you know if you go back a hundred years ago the things we thought we knew about geology just seem sort of laughably wrong today now that we can think about it in terms of these floating plates and the interaction so strike slip uh faults for example can create earthquakes because uh, obviously if you have two big plates rubbing against one another you uh, are going to get some friction and that slip the strike is when it hits, and when the kind of slips past, that's when you can get the earthquake releasing all of that pent-up energy as the plates are kind of crushing together. And of course, those activities are really uh, important for shaping other structures on Earth. So like if two plates are moving together, that means they're moving away from somewhere else, which could be the creation of uh, a canyon. Uh, they could be striking each other and pushing up to create an uplift, like a mountain. Basically, all the features we see on the surface of the Earth today can be traced back to tectonic activity. And so seeing that on another planet or another world would be really interesting because so far we've thought there's nowhere else in the solar system that has tectonic activity. And we're not even really sure if there's anywhere that had tectonic activity in the past. Uh, there's not tectonic activity on Venus. There's not tectonic activity on Mercury. People have kind of tried to squint and argue about Mars a little bit. Um, but if this is 
really what we're seeing, then that would be the second place in the solar system to see this activity and to generate that energy and melt that water. And then you're off to the races talking about life and things like that. Well, this is really good timing because you've got the Europeans working on the JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Satellite Moons Explorer. Explorer, Icy Moons Explorer. Yeah. And there's an instrument on it called the Ganymede Laser Altimeter which is its only job is to measure the height of the ice on Ganymede with precise uh, to precise levels. So, so um, you've got this great discovery on Ganymede and there happens to be a mission on its way to Ganymede to, uh, to try and uncover more information. Coincidence? I'd just like to point out the lead author of this paper is Marissa Cameron. Uh, she's a geologist. Like just, she's a geologist, a geophysicist. Let that sink in. <laughs> she's studying the water. Yes, on planet Earth, are have apparently gotten bored or satisfied with studying the Earth, and now they're studying other planets in the solar system. But but not only that, they're studying water, the movement of water, and how it acts like rock on a on a whole other world, which is mind bending. I love this this idea that you go to to Pluto or you go to Ganymede and the, the way Earth rock acts, then it's water ice, and the way water acts on Earth, there it's ammonia and methane and things like that. So everything's just shifted over. You get these lithological cycles and hydrological cycles, but just at three hundred degrees colder. Yeah. And with different materials, but they play very similar roles. It's this kind of thing that makes planetary science so cool because it's the sort of collision between the theory world of astronomy, where even if we're making observations, we're like looking at little uh, unknowable things and trying to, to figure things out about them. And the sort of super hands on practical world of geologists where you know this lead author has surely gone outside and like picked up a rock and probably she's even been to a strike slip fault and looked at it and had first-hand sense of what that is and here we're combining those two to kind of extrapolate from what we know on earth to explain what we can see elsewhere in the solar system and this has just been as you mentioned at the beginning paul uh, a bonanza for us on mars in terms of identifying uh, water created features, identifying uh, the strata in rocks as when a rover goes up and takes a picture of the side of a cliff, a geologist can go through and mark every one of those and say this formed like this, this formed like that, this formed like this, that one had water, and suddenly just a couple of pictures and we have a whole history of that part of Mars. And then we add in the crater counting and everything that the astronomers have been doing for a long time. So it's, it's really exciting to see another world sort of move into that realm of study and away from the, let's just look at pictures and count things. Um, Morgan, let's talk about uh, the Soyuz mission. So had that gone wrong? It went wrong on the weekend, it right? Went, it, so we no, it was on Wednesday, I think. It was after the show. Because either, I think it was on Wednesday... It was or after the show. After That's the right. show on Wednesday. After. Yeah, so we didn't cover it last week. It happened just after us. Okay. So do you want the good version of the story or the bad version of the story? Well, just explain what happened. Uh, so let's go with the good version. <laughs> the good version is, is that a week ago, uh, Russia was launching a pair of astronauts, an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut, on board uh, a Soyuz capsule on the way to the space station. And about two minutes into the mission... Uh, the rocket suffered a, a failure that hasn't yet been fully understood. And the launch escape system acted almost instantaneously and automatically to move the capsule away from the rocket and take it back safely to the Earth. Uh, and this is actually the third time the Soyuz escape system has been used. Uh, over the last 50 years, it was used like once in the late 70s, once in the early 80s, and then again uh, last week. And that's three times more than any other launch escape system has been used for any past space mission. You know, the space shuttle, as we all know, didn't have a launch escape system. They had one uh, on Apollo. It was never had to be used. Soyuz, it works. It's fast. 
it's automatic, it, it acted exactly as you would expect it to work. The astronauts seemed to be in perfect health, they were communicating the whole way down, uh, and they had a kind of a hell of a roller coaster ride uh, on the way to thumping into Earth. That's the good news, everything has turned out okay. The bad news is what this might mean for the International Space Station and for Russia's space program more broadly. For years now, we've been talking about this sort of declining quality control in the Russian program. And that's always been with the caveat that for whatever reason, the human program seems to have avoided those quality control issues. But suddenly that seems like it's not really true. Because this is the third time this year that a Soyuz rocket has failed. Uh, it's the first time with humans on board, but it's the third time for this basic system. And that could be a coincidence. Soyuz is the most reliable mm -hmm. rocket in history. I shouldn't overlook that. But it fits very nicely into this long pattern over the last decade of sort of tumbling quality in the Russian program. And it bodes really, really poorly for the ISS. Uh, yeah, so if I understand correctly, they've got uh, the ISS, the Soyuz capsule that's already attached onto the space station, has got normally a 200-day lifespan. It's got a it's, shelf life. Uh, yeah, shelf life that it's usable. And the one that's on there right now it runs out in January 2019. So if they can't get another spacecraft up before January they're going to have to evacuate the space station. And for the first time... For the first time in almost 20 years. Um, and in, in theory, the space station can be operated remotely from Houston, um, but that's only if things are working right. It's, it's not an uncommon situation for like an ammonia link to leak to spring, or for they have to patch up a piece of damage from a micrometeorite strike. And these things are so routine that we often don't even cover them on the show. But if you have a leak in your ammonia line and no one's there to fix it and that ammonia bleeds out, well, that's the coolant system. And when the coolant goes away, then right. the motors overheat, for example, that rotate the solar panels to keep them pointing to the sun. And then those motors freeze up and the solar panels lose efficiency. And then the batteries start to drain and then the radios stop working. And suddenly a system that in theory can be entirely controlled from the ground uh, can't contact the ground anymore and it just sort of falls out of orbit and that's 150 or 200 billion dollars down the drain yeah yeah and and the problem of course when nasa canceled the space shuttle back in 2011 the expectation was that the americans would have some method of getting astronauts up to the space station quickly. And it's just taken years and years and years. And here we are now, I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago that the the Crew Dragon is gonna be able to make unmanned tests maybe later this year, probably not able to take humans till next year. Probably not till 2020. 2020. Expectation that they're all gonna slip, <laughs> right. slip again. Elonian years. The, uh, the Starliner is even further behind where uh, SpaceX is. So there's no way that the Americans can get a uh, any astronauts up to the station in time in a way that's safe. Uh, and if you're modern risk-averse NASA, even if Russia says the Soyuz is fine, yeah, prove are, it. Are, are you going to put astronauts back on... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are, are you going to put astronauts back on that thing in the next three months or even in the next year. Couldn't they, though, send another unmanned Soyuz up and then that would restart the shelf life? I think that's an option that's being talked about. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how long the current crew has been in orbit uh, and how long they can be expected to stay in orbit. This hasn't been one of those like year-long missions, and so I think there's every reason to think that if the crew needed to, they could remain on the station for another six months. Or something, and, and the idea of sending up an empty lifeboat capsule is kind of the going idea right now. If the investigation drags on, or if the investigation reveals there actually is a problem, and we can't fix that problem right away. Right. Ugh. Yeah, it's, it's it's a scary time that sort of came out of nowhere. But this is what happens when you only have one system to do anything. Yeah. And the weak link has been launching people. It's it and it, it really sort of brings into that stark 
contrast. Like on the one hand, we see SpaceX landing boosters. We always go back to that idea of the Falcon Heavy launch. And yet the actual, the world space program is in this really fragile state that that the the replacement to the space shuttle, the space launch system is, we talked about this, the, the getting enormous delays, the methods both from Boeing and from space, you got redundancy and yet neither one of them can send humans up to the space station. Clearly there's something going wrong with the quality control happening with the, with the Russian program. It's a really, weird time. Space is sometimes, on the one hand, never felt closer, and on the other hand, never felt farther away than it has in, in decades. So, it's a tough time. So let's hope they sort it out. Because I don't, I don't want us to retreat from space, right? If, if those astronauts do come down, and if there is a problem, and the space station comes down, <sighs> that's a calamity. It sets, yeah. it sets us back years. Yeah, yeah. What comes years next? and years onto the deep space gateway a new space station i don't know it's a it's a it's a bad situation yeah all right so what do you got for us <laughs> all right so i've got two things that are going to drive astronomers crazy and i have sort of mushed them together and so the one is this program an artist is working on something called the orbital reflector and it is going to be it's kind of like, so do you remember last year, the uh, the Rocket Lab on their inaugural mission, they launched the Humanity Star and it was this, this bright uh, ball <laughs> that was visible to Earth. People, the space ball, and people were able to, it's like a disco ball in space. And so an artist is developing a much larger, more complex version that's going to inflate and unfold like a piece of origami uh, and is expected to launch at some point, uh, possibly over the next year, it's like a big, you know, it's 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 an uh, it's a, it's an art project by a guy named Trevor Pagian, and it's surprise, yeah. Who asked for this? No. Well, this is the thing. It's so it's called the orbital reflector, and it's a lightweight material similar to mylar, housed in a small box in a CubeSat, launched in a space aboard a rocket. It will open up and sunlight will reflect off of it, making it visible from the Earth with the naked eye, like a slowly moving artificial star as bright as a star in the Big Dipper. So as bright as one of the brightest stars in the sky. This is the problem with democratized space. Right. Uh, yeah, there's no world space cop, and as long as one country with yeah. rocket power is willing to throw your thing up there and doesn't care what other people think, there's literally nothing that yeah. we could do to stop this kind of thing. I... I hope it blows up on the launch pad, and that would be good art. That's a step. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To have something that bright pass through astronomers' fields of view and ruin the uh, the view is is rough. So I, it's it's interesting to me that after what happened with the Humanity Star, anybody else is considering a similar art project, but. But there's one that's even worse. That's not even the biggest <laughs> one. Yeah, so the Chinese, it's being reported, are planning an artificial moon to replace streetlights. And so they're planning to launch a satellite that will be eight times brighter than the moon, than the full moon. That, and this is the part that I haven't really figured out, but it will, it will as it moves over the Earth, it will light an area 10 to 80 kilometers with eight times the light of the moon. Before the show, we were trying to figure out the orbital mechanics yeah, of yeah. how this thing how even... How would you even pull that off, right? So, I mean, a star that passes through your field of view briefly is bad, but you lose one shot. But something that's eight times brighter than the moon ruins everybody's night vision in all astronomers in the entire area that this thing is going past. It would be... It would be awful. So, so the question is, um, for some reason, so the, so this was reported uh, at a recent uh, aerospace conference, and the part that I haven't been able to figure out is how they how they plan to actually um, uh, how they can have it hover over the city that they want. Will it just be on some kind of orbit that'll bring it back every nighttime, and then? it will only turn itself to reflect when it's over this one city. 
Because if it's on geostationary orbit, it's going to have to be gigantic, and then it could hover over a certain spot of China. But apart from that... Well, and eight times brighter than the moon is like turning off the night over 80 kilometers. Yeah. There's just like, suddenly there's, yeah. there's literally yeah. no darkness. And yeah. that doesn't seem like a, a good thing, either for astronomers or just for like animals or humans or anybody who likes not living... Like this is what we do to people to torture them. Yeah. Is to take away darkness and why would you do this so uh so we'll see if this is actually going to happen and there is a little bit of a um a version of this there's a uh there's a norwegian town that's sort of the bottom of a valley and for a big chunk of the year they don't get the sun ever and so they've got these big reflectors on the top of the mountain that reflect the sunlight back down into the valley and so it's as if they've got the sun for the time when they wouldn't normally have the sun, which is which is sort of nice. I can see that, that being I can see that being all right, but this just sounds like a nobody again, Paul. Nobody asked for this. Nobody wants this. Uh, people are people are concerned about what the animals would do. So anyway, my skeptical hackles are up in that I can't really understand the orbital mechanics of how this would even exist, but but I know that. If you want something to explode on the launch pad, ever proposed this didn't actually do their homework, right? And say, or they're uh, planning. Let's on put a mirror. How about we put a giant mirror in space? We can only sure. hope that yeah. they didn't think it through. Or they put something that's a thousand kilometers across up in geostationary orbit. It's a giant death laser ray, and right. they're disguising it as a mirror for the people <laughs> so what we what we need to do is build a mirror on the ground and point it at the other mirror and you get like infinity mirrors and you lock that light in there and burn it up all right now before we go on to the uh, the last story that we're going to talk about uh we're giving away some copies of of our book oh thank you i yeah did, did, has a copy of the book arrived for you yet paul uh, okay, Maybe Morgan hasn't, got, hasn't gotten his either, so I, I don't have one with me. <laughs> so perhaps we could have organized this a little better, uh, but I'm going to give you the, the advanced versions right now. So uh, the Weekly Space Hangout crew is doing the first book giveaway of the new season. This time they're giving away three copies of the Universe Today Ultimate Guide to Viewing the Cosmos, Everything You Need to Know to Become an Amateur Astronomer uh, by Dave Dickinson and me. Uh, so, as an added bonus, uh, Pamela wrote the foreword. So to enter a chance to win, you can get a free copy of the book. You send an email to giveaways at wshcrew.space with the subject UT Ultimate Guide. Be sure to include your name and email address in the body of your message so the crew can contact the winners afterwards. So to be eligible, your entry must be postmarked no later, postmarked, email marked, no later than uh, midnight on Tuesday, October 30th, 2018. And Wh then, which midnight is that? Uh, Eastern time. So 11, 59, 59 Eastern time on Tuesday, October 30th. And then on Wednesday, on the Wednesday show, uh, on the 31st, uh, I'll pick three winners at random and they will uh, get a copy of the book. Cool. One inch per person. Yeah. And I think... That's the week that Dave and I are going to be the guests oh, for the timing. weekly space hangout. Yeah, and then we'll we'll pick give away some copies, uh, giving away copies of her book. Your move, Paul. I'm giving away complete knowledge of time and space, which nice. is has no value. It's, it's, I can't re-gift that though. <laughs> you can't. Oh, you're gonna re-gift the book when you get a copy. <laughs> don't you put that on me. I think if you don't want me to re-gift it, I'm going to need a personalized copy so that uh, they'll know. Um, oh. Ways I'm doing, I'm doing Galileo Scoop giveaways. Yeah, well, we're going to have you as a guest. That's distressing. Book giveaway. I, oh, yeah, Nancy arranged it with my publisher. You guys are doing book giveaways okay, when I'm perfect. on as a guest. Perfect. Uh, so, again, people want to know the, the email address is giveaways at wshcrew.space, in case you missed that email address. Giveaways at wshcrew.space. All right, let's move on to the last story. Uh, how's Chandra doing? 
Chandra's back. This is the X-ray observatory, one of NASA's great observatories. It was down in safe mode for reasons that nobody's talking about. Yeah. And now it's back. And just pretend the whole thing it never happened. Never happened. It's fine now. Yeah. It's fine. Everything's fine. It's great. Keep looking at those X-rays. We didn't see a horror of the deep in the middle right. of the galaxy. It, we're just, it's, it, that they're telling us. Yeah. Um, it's such an amazing observatory. So much science. It, I know the Hubble captures so much of the public imagination because it has pretty pictures, but all of the great observatories, you know, the Spitzer Infrared, the Chandra, the Fermi, Gamma Ray. I mean, this is covering the electromagnetic spectrum, all possible eyes are watching the universe with these orbiting telescopes. I've heard that the universe is brightest in X-rays. And so if you want to see what the universe really looks like, you need to look at it in X-rays. And if we lose Chandra, then, then we're not able to see it as well. Interesting phraseology. So <laughs> by far the number one source of photons in the universe is the cosmic microwave background. It's like 99.9999% of all radiation in the universe, but it is spread throughout all of the entire universe. So perhaps on our sky with the, with the energy, yeah, maybe x-rays have a shot because Brightness they're is energetic. A word. Yeah, but it's like, it's where it's, all the that's gas That's a tough is, word. Right? That's it. That is, that is a, that is a four letter word in astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> the word brightness. Um, so, so but they're also common yeah. and so they're more common than things like gamma rays which are more energetic uh and they're more energetic than things like radio or microwaves so maybe on balance you know brightness it, however you want to define that x-rays win if you want to look at how the universe really looks you want to look at it at x-rays so paul do you think we're ever going to see another generation of the great observatories of all of them, like this all operating so... at once, like because that was the value, right? If we could look at one thing and all these wavelengths, these amazing instruments, right. and, and now they're all it, dying uh, off because they're all twenty or more years old. They're all way past mission, way yeah, past way. mission life. Like Chandra was supposed to had a planned expectancy of five years. It's at year nineteen, and you know Spitzer's getting up there. Hubble is way past due for a replacement. Uh, Fermi is still chugging along, but you know who knows how long it has. It's weird. There doesn't seem to be an impetus, like a drive, to replace wholesale all of these observatories right. with Great Observatories Part Two. And what are we going to miss? I mean, yeah, like ground-based observatories are really coming along, and we're learning lots of stuff. But there are some things we can only learn by having a space-based platform. And we're we're gonna miss out. Yeah. James Webb can't do all of it. Right. So you've got the Lynx mission, which is in the next version of the Great Observatory. It's in the the next decadal survey right now, and it's gonna be a next generation um, X ray telescope after you know Chandra, but better. Um, and then you've got James Webb, which is gonna tackle the first iteration of the of the infrared spectrum and then you're going to get something like the ost um which is going to come out as you know 2035 and it's going to be like a nine like 20 20 never never um and then of course louvoir again 20 never never squared but that's going to be the visible and the the near infrared and the ultraviolet so if you had links louvoir and the the follow on to James Webb, you would have that next generation of your great observatories, and they're all planned. You new gamma gamma ray. You yes. still need those high energies. Yeah. You still need uh, deep infrared pushing into microwave. Right. Which um, James, well, that's you know, maybe maybe Europeans will come along and do something nice. Yeah, it'd be nice if someone else would build. Uh, part of this. Um, if a bunch of countries each contributed one, there might actually be the chance of getting this into space before 2050. Hmm. 
Well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed for for. Preparing for the future. <laughs> right. It's a sign of the times. Yeah, yeah. The rocketry is uh, having its problems. Uh, we just had our update about James Webb. We'll, I'll leave that there. Um, last week we talked about the state of the SLS. Uh, do, Paul, give us some good news. What's something that you're working on? That's something that I'm working on. Hey, uh, uh, I'll go with this. So besides my book, pmsutter.com slash book, which is coming out in November. Um, if, have I have I promoted the, the new dance project I'm working on? <laughs> no. I, I think you mentioned it last week in New York. Tell us about it. Oh, uh, so, I, so I'm working with Siren Modern Dance in a, a New York-based dance company, uh, exploring the nature of time, hence this podcast episode that I just recorded about time, uh, but working with dancers to interpret it, to express it, to, to find new ways to share that juicy science knowledge. We've crafted a very, very cool performance, mixing uh, narration and dance, uh, stagecraft. It's really fun. Uh, they're actually coming to Columbus next week. And we're going to have a performance in Columbus, a studio showing of work in progress on Saturday, the 27th. Uh, and then we're going to have another studio showing in New York, uh, Saturday, December 1st. So you can go to my website, pmstarter.com for links and info. You could like show relativity through dance, time dilation. That'd be cool. No, exactly, exactly. And that's it, this has been so much fun. So I love working with artists, except the ones who put giant shiny things in orbit. <laughs> uh, I, I, love, I love working with artists because there's a lot of people that I could, you know, would never show up to a podcast or a show or a lecture about relativity, but they would show up to a dance performance about relativity. And by working with the choreographers, working with the dancers of how to express this, how to communicate it, what's the essential bits of knowledge, People get the idea is people go to a performance, an art performance, appreciate it for what it is, and then also learn about how the universe works. Awesome. Morgan? Oh, I've just produced a whole episode of the Weekly Space <laughs> Hangout, and oh, holy cow, is it hard. <laughs> so, all I was doing was the simplest part. So, I feel like I've accomplished a week's worth of work in just the last hour. Uh, but you can check out, we've got great new episodes of Crash Course Engineering going up uh, on youtube.com slash Crash Course. Turns out engineering's really cool. Not just the space stuff either, but I've been, there'll be some episodes coming up all around uh, like biomedical engineering in terms of like how do you make pacemakers and stuff like that. And it's just really cool to think of the stuff that they're building and that will then live inside you forever. That's... That's yeah. just awesome. And so I've had a lot of fun exploring a whole different way of solving problems. Very cool. Um, for me, of course, it's just book, 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 book. That'll be you in another, yeah, <laughs> in another month, Paul. Um, but you're already there uh, into the book event horizon, entering the book singularity. Um, but uh, so the book comes out on the 23rd. And just remember, there's some crazy low price right now on Amazon. I don't understand why, but it's only $18.95 as opposed to the list price, which is like $28. So if you're sitting on the fence, uh, grab a copy now from Amazon.com. Pre-order. Make us look good in the pre-orders. Then we'll boost up to the top of the lists and we'll just carry us through. We'll be able to just keep releasing new versions of the books and that's all, all I'll ever talk about. Book, 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 book. All right. <laughs> you make it a two for you. You're buying a Christmas present for someone. Yeah. Totally. Buy him your place in the universe, understanding our big. I mean, what a perfect companion. There's one book that you can use to understand the night sky and our place and how to see it. And then another book to totally confuse you. <laughs> and so they just go Amazon together. was recommending just perfect yin and yang. That both books would go together, apparently. Yeah, what's the right order to read them in? <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay, so it depends. Wait, we are the one that confuses people? I'm the one that confuses people. Oh, okay. People. All right. So, yeah, no, your your book is great. So, if you if you want to follow the typical scientist journey, you start with Fraser's book and then you get to my book and then you're lost and befuddled and confused and alone and afraid and that's science. Uh, if you want to feel actually smart around a dinner table conversation, you start with my book, 
where you, nothing makes sense. Then you read Fraser's book and things begin to crystallize and you can, you can say smart things. Perfect. There you go. We've solved all your holiday gift giving problems. Right on. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Paul. And of course, uh, Paul, who's out with us. Thanks everyone to the WSH crew for helping us coordinate this show. It was very difficult, but we did it. We did it. So uh, good job, Morgan. You're an engineer now. <laughs> Crash course engineering. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, back, but uh, next episode, I will be back at my regular studio, and uh, things, will be a lot, things will be a lot smoother. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all next week. So press that button. Press the button, Frank. Press, 